The Battle of Majuba, fought in South Africa on the 27th of February 1881, was one of the British Army's most humiliating defeats. Of their force of 400 men, 92 were killed, including their commanding general, 134 were wounded, and 59 captured, a 70% casualty figure. And in comparison, their Boer opponents lost just two men dead and four wounded. It would result in the Boers reclaiming their independence from Britain, the first time since the American colonists that part of the British Empire had successfully broken free. It's a story of folly mixed with ego and a good dose of bravery too. This is the story of that calamitous defeat in South Africa in 1881. The Battle of Majuba was the final bloody encounter in what was termed the First Boer or Anglo-Boer War, fought in 1881. The Boers were descendants of Dutch and French settlers who had colonised the Cape at the tip of South Africa in the 17th and 18th centuries. When the British gained control of the region in the early 1800s, many of these Boers trekked inland and established their own independent republics. However, by the 1870s, things changed. The British were keen to establish a South African confederation, similar to Canada, and started to apply pressure on the Boers. It so happened that the Boer economies, which were principally agricultural as gold was yet to be discovered, were on the verge of bankruptcy. Reluctantly, they agreed to join the British Empire, on the understanding that the British would pump investment into the two former Boer republics of Transvaal and Orange Free State. The British also promised to get rid of the threats presented by the Boers' traditional black enemies, not least the Zulus. By 1880, the relationship between the Boers and the British had already gone sour. The investment was minimal, and the Calvinistic Boers disliked British authority, not least their more liberal treatment of the black population. True, the Zulus had eventually been defeated, but rather like in North America back in the 1760s and 70s when the French threat had been removed. The removal of the Zulu threat also removed one of the reasons for having further British protection. Moreover, the dismal performance of the British early on in that war had reduced the Boers' respect for British fighting prowess. By December 1880, the Boers in the Transvaal had had enough, and under the leadership of their former Vice President, Paul Kruger, they rose in rebellion. The small British garrisons across the country were besieged, and a Boer army under Piet Joubert moved across the border into the British colony of Natal to block any British army advancing against them. And the British were coming, in the form of General George Pomfrey Coley. Born in 1835 in County Kildare, Ireland, Coley was a prodigious talent in the British Army. He attended Staff College and completed the two-year course in just ten months, passing out at the head of the list. The Victorian British Army was always a bit suspicious of clever officers. Coley, however, was fortunate enough to become the protégé of General Sir Garnet Wolseley. Serving Wolseley in the Ashanti War, George Coley became one of the key members of Wolseley's Ashanti Ring. He was so trusted by Wolseley that when the latter became commander in South Africa in 1879, he requested that Coley leave his post in India and join him. Upon Wolseley's departure in 1880, Coley was appointed Governor of Natal Colony and High Commissioner for Southeastern Africa, effectively the military as well as political power in this part of the British Empire. Gathering what forces he could muster, Coley now advanced from Natal towards the border with the Transvaal. On the 28th of January 1881, General Coley suffered an embarrassing and costly defeat at Lang's Neck, when his force, principally consisting of the 58th Regiment of Foot and the 60th Rifles, ran into a hail of fire from the Boers. Less than two weeks later, on the 8th of February, he suffered a further embarrassing reversal at the Battle of Ingogo. The British government and British public opinion were stung. Prime Minister William Gladstone, who had come to power the previous year, had always been against the annexation of the Transvaal. Now the British Prime Minister decided it was time to reverse the previous government's confederation policy. On the 16th of February, London instructed General Coley to offer Kruger an armistice and an invitation to peace talks if he desisted from further armed opposition. Many in Britain opposed Gladstone's move, but not least the opposition Conservatives, the Queen and General Sir Garnet Wolseley. They saw it as peace under defeat. It was a view shared by Wolseley's protégé in Natal, General Coley. Not that Coley was against peace per se, 
just not one that was the result of British military reversals, especially as those reversals had come on his watch. Not for the first time, a British military leader was to be driven by a desire to restore their own reputation. He was determined to push the Boers out of Natal and put them at the military disadvantage before any peace negotiations took place. And he spotted a chink in Gladstone's armour. The Prime Minister up in London had specifically stated that if Kruger agreed to the armistice, then their troops would remain in Natal until the peace negotiations could be concluded. Coley issued the invitation to Kruger, thus carrying out his orders from London, but then added his own condition, that Kruger must respond positively within 48 hours for the armistice to take effect. Kruger was way off in the Transvaal. It would take at least six days for him to receive the message and then get his reply to Coley, which was all the time Coley needed. He had an audacious plan to dislodge the Boers under the wily Piet Joubert from their positions at Lang's Neck. Towering over 1,000 feet above Joubert's lager wagons was the hill, or mountain, of Majuba. Coley's plan was to occupy the summit and intimidate the Boers into withdrawing. It was no mean feat, especially as he planned to climb the mountain in the middle of the night. But Coley was confident he could put it off. It was his moment to emulate General Wolfe scaling the heights of Abraham before the Battle of Quebec. And despite how we now know it turned out, it actually came a lot closer to success than we tend to remember. Naturally, the deadline for his invitation to Kruger regarding the armistice was missed, and Coley decided to carry out his plan. At 10.30pm on the 26th of February, 1881, he assembled a scratch force of about 400 men to ascend the mountain. His band of would-be heroes consisted of two companies of the 58th Regiment of Foot, who had a score to settle with the Boers after their encounter at Lang's Neck. You may recall the 58th from my previous talk on the Battle of Ulundi. They were present at that final battle of the Zulu War, and now 171 of them would be present at the final battle of the First Boer War too. However, unlike Ulundi, this would not be a walkover. The 58th would later become the Northamptonshire Regiment, my dad's old regiment, and are now part of the modern-day Anglian Regiment. On this climb to the summit of Majuba, they would be joined by three companies consisting of 140 men from the 92nd Regiment, the Gordon Highlanders. The 92nd had only arrived in Natal just two weeks beforehand, having been stationed in India for the past 13 years. They had recently served with distinction in the Second British-Afghan War, also called the Second Anglo-Afghan War. And finally, these two infantry regiments were joined by 50 men from the Naval Brigade. These armed sailors from HMS Dido had marched up from Durban, pulling two field guns. However, Cody decided that they would leave those guns back at his camp. Indeed, he decided against taking any guns with him at all, which would come back to bite him, as you're going to find out. Assembling his men for the nighttime ascent, he decided to protect his line of communication by positioning the 60th Rifles, along with a squadron of dismounted men from the 15th Hussars, at the base of the mountain. Now, led by some local African guides, they started their advance. Finding a sheep track, they started to move up towards the summit in the darkness. It was a tough climb. Very tough. Over 1,000 feet in the dark. Each man carrying a Martini Henry rifle, 70 rounds of ammunition, a full water bottle, three days worth of tins of bully beef rations, a waterproof sheet and their great coat. At places it was so steep that the men had to climb on their hands and knees. So you can see why Coley had decided against trying to manhandle artillery up this slope. Finally, after a four hour climb, they reached the summit at 4.30 a.m. They found the mountain completely unoccupied. Coley had achieved his element of surprise. Over a mile below him, General George Coley could see the lanterns in the Boer lager. His enemy was sleeping, blissfully unaware of his strategic masterstroke. With dawn starting to break, many of the exhausted men slumped to the ground to rest. The summit of Majuba is effectively a long, flat plateau, with two slightly raised knolls. Coley positioned just over half his men on the perimeter and held the rest back as a reserve. Not that they'd be needed. In fact, Coley was so confident 
that despite the fact his men had brought picks and shovels, he decided not to entrench the British position. Meanwhile, down in the Boer camp, Pete Joubert's men were waking up to a shocking sight. Up on the skyline of the mountain, towering above their camp, they could see British troops. Lots of them. If there were any doubt they were British, they soon weren't, as the Highlanders of the 92nd started shouting abuse down at them. An officer even took a few pot shots, but as the camp was out of rifle range, he was promptly ordered to stop by Coley. From up on top of Majuba, the British watched a flurry of activity down in the Boer camp. Men mounting up, oxen being fetched for the wagons. It looked like their very presence on the mountain was going to force the Boers into a retreat, without a shot being fired. What a great way to enter the peace negotiations. Coley, the new General James Wolfe. Down in the Boer camp, there was indeed consternation. If the British started to fire on them with their artillery, Joubert's position was untenable, and he would have to pull back. Have you spotted the slight problem here? That's right. Coley hadn't actually taken any artillery up there to bombard them with. And as we've seen, even his rifles couldn't hit the Boer camp. So, whilst he occupied the high ground, he was unable to actually hit the Boers. And it wouldn't take long for his enemy to spot that. Meanwhile, Joubert decided his best form of defence was attack. Commandant Nicolas Smith now organised his men into attacking forces to storm the mountain. Riding out of their lager, they galloped to the base of Majuba and tied up their horses and started to climb. Using the landscape to hide their movements, while those behind them provided covering fire that kept the British heads down, they slowly climbed the mountain. It took them over three hours. Meanwhile, Coley seemed oblivious to the mountain danger. Anyway, he held the high ground. So it came as a bit of a surprise when shortly before one o'clock in the afternoon, the British suddenly came under fire. The Boers had managed to manoeuvre their way up Majuba and occupied one of those two knolls that I mentioned earlier. Incredibly, Coley had left it undefended. Now from a range of 100 yards, the Boers opened up a rapid and accurate fire on Coley's men. Confusion now reigned in the British ranks as a withering fire swept across the plateau. Men huddled for cover, others milled around, officers tried to restore some sort of order. A young lieutenant by the name of Ian Hamilton asked Coley for permission to lead a bayonet charge to clear the Boers from the summit. The general refused. And then at around 2pm, after being fired on for over an hour, the British position collapsed. Terrified soldiers ignored their officers and fled down the path which they descended that very morning. The flight became a rout. As the naval brigade and the 58th abandoned their positions, a party of the 92nd under Lieutenant Hector MacDonald desperately tried to hold out. With the British fleeing in front of them, the Boers now moved out of cover and advanced, firing from the shoulder. It was carnage. Lance Corporal Joseph John Farmer was attending the wounded in a first aid station on the summit. Born in 1854 in the King's Cross area of London, Farmer had originally been in the Merchant Navy. Surviving two shipwrecks, he decided a sailor's life was not for him, and after surviving smallpox, he took an interest in medicine. In 1879, he joined the Army Hospital Corps and was sent to South Africa. He arrived in time to treat the wounded at the Battle of Ulundi in the Zulu War, and if you recall from my talk on that battle, there weren't that many British casualties to deal with. But now, on top of Majuba, he had his work cut out as Boer bullets whistled around him. Lance Corporal Farmer tried to signal to the Boers that the men around him were wounded by holding a white sheet over their bodies. In the mayhem, his arm holding the sheet was hit by a bullet. Refusing to abandon his charges, he now used his other arm to hold up the sheet again. That arm was shot through as well. Joseph John Farmer was awarded the Victoria Cross for his act of valour that day on the summit of Majuba. He would be medically discharged after the war and ended up back in London where he died in 1930. He's buried at Brompton Cemetery. This old cemetery is a veritable hero's acre in London. Farmer is one of 12 Victoria Cross recipients buried there. There are also two field marshals and six generals. Included in that number is General Frederick Thesiger, second Lord Chelmsford. Yes, him of Isandwana and Zulu fame. Maybe I should do a talk about Brompton Cemetery sometime and all the people that are there. <laughs> what do you think? Drop me a line. Anyway, back to that early afternoon on the 27th of February 1881 at Majuba Hill. General Coley's attempt to emulate General James Wolfe had gone horribly wrong. They'd scaled the heights of Majuba, but now the British were racing downhill as fast as the legs could carry them. 
Instead of the Boers panicking and withdrawing, it was his own troops who were retreating in panic. But in one way, General Coley did emulate Wolfe. He too died in battle. The last anyone saw of him, he was advancing on the Boers, firing his revolver. General George Pomeroy Coley was killed with a single shot to his forehead. As the escaping British troops tumbled down the mountainside, they were easy prey for the Boer sharpshooters, now lining the summit and firing at them from above. Reaching the base, they found no safety with the 60th Rifles and 15th Hussars, because Spit was now leading mounted Boers around the mountain towards them. The danger of a complete encirclement of the British force was only alleviated by the British artillery back in their camp, opening up, enabling a fighting retreat. The Battle of Majuba was an unmitigated disaster for the British. Along with Coley, they lost 92 men killed. A further 134 were wounded. 50 men and 7 officers were captured. 70% of Coley's force that had set out that morning had been lost. And in return, the Boers had lost 2 men dead and 4, possibly 5, wounded. One of the British prisoners was Lieutenant Ian Hamilton, who'd asked to lead the bayonet charge against the Boers. Eventually, rising to the rank of general, he would command the Gallipoli landings during the First World War. Another officer who was taken prisoner at Majuba was Lieutenant Hector MacDonald. Pete Joubert was so impressed with his courage that day that he actually returned his surrendered sword to him. Hector MacDonald, who'd been promoted from the ranks, would go on to become a general and was one of the heroes at both the Battle of Omdurman and later in the Second Anglo-Boer War where he commanded the Highland Brigade. An inspirational and sad story that I've told in the past. I'll post a link in the description. Far from dislodging the Boers and negotiating from a position of strength, Coley had instead put the Boers in an even stronger position. With Coley's death in action, command now passed to another member of Walsley's shanty ring, Sir Evelyn Wood. Wood was instructed to negotiate a peace as soon as possible. Despite the fact that Lord Roberts of Kandahar was on his way with 10,000 troops, the British government had no desire to get bogged down in a war with the Boers. An armistice was agreed on the 6th of March. Actually, it was the armistice that Coley had sent to Kruger back in February. The Boer leader had received it and agreed to its terms on the 4th. So Majuba didn't really need to have been fought at all. The ensuing peace treaty agreed that the Transvaal could once again become the independent South African Republic. It was the first time since the American colonists that part of the British Empire had successfully broken free. The British experiment of creating a Southern African Federation was at an end. Not that the British particularly cared. Transvaal had no economic value. In fact, if they played their cards right, Kruger would probably be broke and come crawling back within a few years. Clever. Except that just five years later, gold was discovered near Johannesburg. Rather than being broke, Paul Kruger would be able to afford the most modern European weapons when he next came to blows with the British, as he would in 1899. And that conflict, the Second Boer War of 1899-1902, to is the subject of another talk, a link to which is appearing in a moment. Give it a watch. Thanks for joining me today and I hope you enjoyed that story about the Battle of Majuba. My next talk will bring us into the 20th century as I look at the Aden emergency in the 1960s. Don't forget to sign up for my free weekly newsletter and history timeline. Click the link in the description. And also check out my Boer War video too. Thanks for your support. Keep well and I'll see you very soon.